This is Eastman's Elevated Podcast. I have on great guests that are really knowledgeable, consistently successful. We're able to dive deep down the rabbit holes of these different subject matters of shooting, of physical fitness, of mental toughness and drive. All the different skills that make up a complete hunter that you can become. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? I've got a brand new podcast for you. So this week I have on Remy Warren. And I'm excited to release this one to you guys. Um, I really think of Remy is like a modern day explorer. You know, he, he hunts all over the lower 48, Alaska, Hawaii, and then he started to venture off into these different countries. And in these different countries, the logistics are so tough. It's like the lower 48 on steroids. I mean, to follow all the, all the rules and regulations and, and to get the, the licensing and the tags and, and to figure out access of lands or, or public lands. And it it's just has all these logistics to figure out. And he's got really good at it over the years. And, and I just find a lot of inspiration and motivation in these adventure hunts that he's going on. And, and Remy also, you know, he's, he's got a ton of skill, like experience is the best teacher. And I, I've been able to share a couple hunts with him now. And, um, you know, he's just got great intuition about the, the animals and their behavior and, and the habitat where he's hunting. And, and he's, he's got, you know, great skill too, as far as, as stalking and decision making. And it all comes from experience. So he's a, he's really fun to hang out with. And I'm really excited to have him on the podcast and share our conversation with you today. So, um, yeah, it's all about adventure hunting and the logistics and we just get into it. The conversation comes easy, but it, it's just a great one that I really enjoyed that I think you guys will, will really enjoy too. Sponsor for today's show is Yeti Coolers. Uh, Yeti has just changed the way I hunt. So um, I just got done um, sharing a hunt with Remy out in Hawaii for mouflon sheep out there. And so um, in our group, we harvested a handful of sheep, and, and the Yetis just saved us. We'd have a Yeti every day in each truck and like a soft-sided, I think mine's called a Hopper 30, and it's soft-sided. Um, and then we'd put ice in there, and we'd have cold drinks in there. And then if you harvested a mouflon, you could get that meat on ice in that cooler bag right away and get it cooled down because, you know, we're talking 90 degree heat, high humidity, like everything starts to rot out there in a matter of minutes. And so we were able to keep all our meat from all our sheep, of course. And then I also harvested an axis deer. I used those soft sided coolers. Um, you know, I got the meat back to Hawaii, was able to, or back to uh, uh, my buddy's house there on Hawaii, was able to process it freeze it in his freezer, put it in that Yeti hopper. I fit in a sheep and an axis deer and then fly home with it frozen, use it as my carry on, have it here at my house and then share it with my family. So it, it's such a cool deal, but uh, Yeti just keeps the ice longer. Um, you know, I use their coolers for all my hunt hunts. Um, it helps so much to have a big cooler back in your truck that you can get an elk in and get it chilled down. I make so many hot weather hunts um, that it, it really extends the days I can be out there and it's, it's just great for meat care to get everything cooled down and chilled. And like I say, it's just changed the way I hunt. I always mention too, that it's a bear proof container. So national forests that have restrictions on storing your food in a bear proof container, um, you know, you can hang it in a tree 10 foot up, four foot away from the trunk, or you can just stick it in a Yeti and stick a lock on it. So your truck does not count as a bear proof container. A normal cooler does not count as a bear proof container, but a Yeti does. So uh, a bunch of different products. They're, they're thermoses, they're, they're, they're cups, uh, you know. Everything, they're, they're soft-sided coolers. I want to get one of those backpack coolers. Uh, they look like uh, they're pretty cool, and then you could carry your stuff with you. Um, and, and then they're big coolers. I think I run the, the, the 110 or the 120, and I can fit an entire elk in it. It's just amazing. But um, great coolers, great product. Thanks to Yeti for sponsoring the podcast. Over there at Eastman's, um, yeah, we're just getting ready for season, uh, getting everybody's hunts lined up, getting all our video stuff lined up, um, got everything turned in. Uh, I've got my hunts that I'm going to film this year, so I'm uh, going to do that Wyoming high country deer hunt, super excited about, and then going to do my Montana elk hunt. 
Uh, so I got a couple I'm going to film, a couple I'm not going to film, which is nice too, you know, where you just immerse yourself in the experience. And um, and I love to hunt wilderness so much, like a lot of these filmed hunts can only be done on national forest. Um, but it, it's going to be fun to really focus and try to capture a couple of these and uh, put out my best films to date. And then it's going to be really fun to not try to capture them and try to go for a big one. Um, gosh, I've got, you know, I've got plenty of meat this season. I've got a bunch of tags. Like I just can't wait to just hunt hard and push my body, try to hold out for, uh, for a good critter and, uh, just have some fun family and friends and see where I'm at. Um, so exciting antelope season opens here in a couple days. Can't wait to start chasing those things around. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just trying to get all my work done, all my responsibilities taken care of, still get my runs in, been running my dog like a madman, uh, got out hopper fishing the other day, um, got out with some buddies uh, one afternoon after work, and then um, got out my, with my wife the next day, uh, able to land a really nice fish out there and have fun with her and, you know, catch a bunch of them. So, um, so that was fun. One last hurrah on the river. And uh, yeah, just living life to the fullest here. So let, let's get into this podcast. I'm rambling on. So a great podcast. This is um, uh, Remy Warren and uh, me, your host, Brian Barney, Eastman's Elevated. Here we go. All right. Well, we'll just get right into it and get talking as I know the podcast will come easy. Um, man, you've been busy. You've been traveling all over. Uh, it's been a really cool deal to see that uh, that Seiko traveling you've been doing. I built that rifle and then I saw you were in Australia, uh, Asiatic water buffalo. Man, that was a wild hunt. Yeah, it was, it was a really fun trip. You know, I've hunted them before, but um, it was just pretty cool to actually like there's a lot of hunts that I've done that was, I did that archery hunt before. And I actually, when I was there, I thought this would actually be really fun rifle hunt. Um, kind of just push yourself, try to find the biggest one you can. And, uh, I don't know. I, I really enjoyed that trip. It was pretty cool. Man, it looked really cool. There's nothing more remote than that. Northern territories of Australia. There is nothing out there. Is there? No, it's like you'll drive. I mean, from town, you're driving hours just on dirt roads and, there's a few small communities out there, but um, a community could just be like this two small houses, <laughs> and they call that a community. So you're like, oh, the, that community on the map, it's literally like two little houses. Two houses makes a town in Australia, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Like, if a couple people live here, it's a town. Well, it's wild because it's like a different kind of remote, too, because uh, – most of the time when we think of remote in the lower 48, we think about backpacking way back into a wilderness and being by ourselves back there. But it's just a different case in that northern territories where it's so remote, but you have to have a vehicle and rely upon a vehicle just to get out there and cover the miles to even see that place. Yeah, that's that's the thing is like you can kind of drive. Well, it was quite – it was pretty wet while I was there. So, you know, that limits your access. So so – almost over half the year you just can't even access most of it but yeah you can drive you know it's fairly flat and there are roads put in places and it's almost like people just push roads out through whatever and as it gets drier you can drive more places um but yeah you can kind of drive anywhere but if your vehicle breaks down you're you're really you really are screwed like there's you know, it might be a month long walk back. You go, oh shit. <laughs> you know? And if you got to cross any kind of water or anything, you probably aren't going to make it back. Um, there's actually a guy right now uh, that's doing like a solo trip, just like hiking across Arnhem Land. And I, I don't know how long it'll take, probably take a couple months. But I'm like, man, that's, that's a pretty crazy uh, feat to do. And there's guys, you know, like Aboriginals will leave one area and they'll just start walking <laughs> and then they'll just end up in some other, other town or whatever. If they don't have vehicle, they're just like, Oh yeah, we'll just, we just walk. And it's pretty crazy to think like that's, that's a different level of survival and skills necessary to, to actually get to where you're going. And I imagine quite a few of them don't make it because of the dangers there of the crocs and the snakes and the other stuff. Like you just, something happens, you're in real trouble. Man, that is the true definition of nomadic. Yeah, that's wild. Um, 
Yeah, it's, it's there's only a few places or a few times in my life where I've really felt that, and I definitely feel it in the wilderness or backpacking into spots. But like that that feeling that you're talking about in northern territories, where you'd have to walk for a month to get out of there, and you may not even make it with all the river crossings. Like I get that feeling in some places in Alaska when I'm dropped off by the bush plane, and there's a hundred to two hundred miles where there's just nothing. There's no infrastructure. There's no roads. And and to get back, like yeah, I can do a hundred miles, but I don't think I can do a hundred miles through the Muskeg and cross the three rivers I need to in the middle of the winter. So you're almost so remote. Like I, I guess it would always come down to hiking out if you had to save your life and had to survive. But some of those places are just so re- remote. Like to take on a month long walk to try to get yourself out, um, you're really trusting in your your gear and your equipment and your vehicle oh yeah definitely and the the nice thing like the difference between say there and alaska is there is uh you know there are these communities out there and road systems so you know you could you could make it to a road or whatever just depends on where you're at whereas if you're in alaska dropped off by float plane you have to you have to walk the full distance and then you have to navigate to the exact location where something is um you know, but but it's just a different kind of remote because you're in a, you know, at least for me, it's a foreign place. And you go, man, there's just so much land up here with not a lot going on. You know, it, it, it'd almost be like if you could take Alaska and then you had road access because it was just flattened out. Um, you'd be very, very similar to that. You know, not a lot in between these little towns and little communities, but um, except just big vast chunks of land it's pretty cool oh well and i know what you're saying about like some animals and some hunts are just built for rifle hunts and you're really skilled like i got a chance to hunt with you in new zealand you're so skilled with your bow and arrow and that's um you're really drawn to it and i know you do a lot of hunts with your bow and arrow and me too i just absolutely love a bow but there's some places like you say you hunted australia once with your bow And in that brush and being able to still hunt with a rifle, it's still close encounters and you're still close to them. But, you know, you're a little bit more efficient and effective with a rifle hunting through that place. So I understand what you're saying when you say it was fun to take a rifle back there and go hunt through there and look for the biggest bull. It looked like you harvested a good one. Yeah, no, the one that I got was like, you know, it is what you'd look for if you had a rifle and you could pick whatever buffalo you wanted. That's the one that you want. Um, and they're few and far between in the area that I was at, they, very few of them get that, get that big. So it was kind of um, a pretty lucky to even find that one. And then pretty cool to be able to get on it. And when I went on that hunt, I just said, I, I really wanted to hunt it. Like when I have a rifle, I mean, I've done all the long range shooting stuff. I've done all that, but when I'm hunting for myself, I like to get bow distance with a rifle. Like it's just the fun part is the stock and the sneak and then you know, to use a rifle or a bow or whatever. It's like I get the excitement out of getting close and getting those close encounters. So that was the fun part about it. But the other thing was I was just thinking there's no hunt that I've ever been on where you could use like a – where you needed like a big bore rifle. <laughs> just kind of the idea of using like a large rifle seemed appealing. Because when I was out there last time, I mean, it is a great bow hunt because – That time, well, early in the season, it can be a little tough because everything's spread out with the water. Both times I've hunted um, water buffalo, they've been really spread out. So there's just a lot of miles finding where they're at. Now, if you go later in the season, it's probably just a slam dunk because they're all concentrated on one water source. and You just go to that water and every buffalo for 100 miles would be around that water and they aren't moving very much then. But this time of year, there's grass is high. They can feed anywhere. They can drink anywhere. And they're just cruising, and they're so big. Like I would spot a bull, and not even see its head. It'd be its head would be down feeding, and you think, oh, you'll never lose a two thousand pound animal. And in two steps, they just disappear in that grass. And you go to where they were, and they're already half a mile away just because they walk so fast, their stride so long. They can just cover ground. You almost have to like stalking them is different because you got to sprint to catch up to them, and then try to sprint to cut them off. It's like a lot of a lot of running. It's pretty, it's pretty different. I love that style of hunting that I, uh, it's not the politically correct term, but I always feel like a, like an Apache running after a game animal or trying to cut them off. But I love yeah. uh, that high action 
and and trying to cut animals off, trying to run to keep up with them, sweat going down your face like that. That is an exciting way to hunt animals. I really like that, and I just think like it's part of the reason why I think you're such a skilled hunter is hunting all these different species in different habitats improves your skill set in different ways and so like you go on that hunt in australia and you're really working on your still hunting skills but then you're also working on your quick and you're running and you're cutting them off and you're trying to read where the animals are moving i i just think like these different challenges that we take on they improve our skill sets in different ways wouldn't you agree oh yeah because you know you take an animal that maybe you don't have a lot of familiarity with but every time you go do something new, you get better at learning animals quickly and understanding like different techniques for hunting and when to apply them. And it, you know, there's there might be something that you do on that hunt that you don't get enough practice doing somewhere else. But when that moment arises, you know, okay, that animal's acting this way. I can do that. I know that works in different situations. And then you can make it work wherever it needs to work. So it really makes you more successful in the long run, especially just the almost like the the learning aspect, but learning to learn quickly. And that's that's huge when you go into any new area, any new hunt. I mean, how many, I always think about it is like how many guys might draw a tag in the States here that might be a, a species that they've never hunted before. They don't know anybody that's hunted it. And it's a once in a lifetime type tag and you want to make the best out of it. So that's, you know, you, you can almost even do that. I, I like to do that here at home where I just pick new areas all the time and just go, go hunt those areas because you get better at learning about animals and learning how to adjust and how to find things. It, it, it just like increases your skill level like exponentially, really. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and then those skills transpose to other hunts, just like you're, just like you're saying. And, um, I, I like the way you stated that, that it's like the quicker you have to adapt to the conditions you're seeing in real time. You have to evolve to what the animals in the, the habitat is giving you. So you're right. You, you just, um, you get really good at, at adapting on the fly or learning quick or being able to recognize patterns or behaviors with animals. And then you're able to apply it. But, and, and really experience is the absolute best teacher out there. Like it, it, you know, if you're paying attention to it, you're you're able to learn and evolve and and put those that skill set in place. So, like when you when you do draw one of those really sought after Western tags, or you're going after a once in a lifetime tag, if you've got all this hunting experience to rely upon and, and success to draw from, you know you can go into that that hunt. And, and you're going to turn up animals and you're going to create opportunities to where if you're not hunting a whole lot and you're waiting 10 years to draw one tag, you can draw the best tag in the lower 48 and go in there. You just don't have the skill set to be able to locate the animals, to be able to create the opportunities, to be able to make the right decisions, to, to be able to be successful. So experience is the best teacher, and especially when you 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 vary it so much. Like you do, you have hunted so many different species in so many different places, and, and I'm sure like um it, it just it it's taught you how to adapt on the fly really quick and and to be effective in these different places i'm the same way man i love to explore i love to hunt new areas uh i, I think it's human nature to to look at new spots i don't like going back to the same spots or if i do i like to look at that and then see like like where I can go from where I've been. Like I look at a drainage and I look at the way it faces, the way it lays out, where I've seen deer before. And then I try to find other drainages that are close that I can walk to, you know, that look the same as that. But, uh, man, it's so important. And the way you stated it is just perfect. Yeah, it's, it is it is fun just kind of when you're out there feeling like you're exploring something new too. I mean, I, I you know, with guiding, I get to hunt the same area a lot like every day of the season and over the course of my entire life. And because of that, in that area, I, you know, I've become super successful and I've, I've learned a lot, but it's weird because what I remember as a kid or even in my mid twenties, you know, 10 years ago, certain places, it seems that it seemed so big and so wild. And now it just seems so small and so docile. And it's only because <laughs> you know, what's around the corner. There's not, you know, when you know something so well and you've been through it so many times, it just like it literally feels like your backyard. And I mean, to get to that point it took thousands of days, you know, it doesn't happen everywhere. But that's 
it's kind of cool to go into a new area because you get that whole that whole exploration feeling. But you know, there there is something to be said for hunting the same. If you if you just want to be successful for one thing and in to keep hunting the same place because every little bit of knowledge you get makes you more successful in that place for sure. And you can take those those things other places. But I, there's just something about that exploration aspect that really excites me. I mean, that was the whole reason that I went to New Zealand in the first place about, I don't even know, maybe 10 years ago now. I hadn't really, at that time, I'd never even really heard of people doing DIY hunts in New Zealand. I thought, nah, I researched it, put in the time like that'll be an adventure. And now after, you know, 10 years of exploring that country, you start to feel like, okay, I got this figured out. Where else can I go? And I've just been looking at other places around the world where I can do the same thing and just go and just feel like I'm exploring and, and doing something different and something new for me. And that's, I don't know, that that's always exciting for me. Oh, dude, you're a true adventurer. You're going to the last frontiers and places where other hunters don't go and, and then learning it and exploring it yourself. Yeah, it was wild to see New Zealand, to see a place that you had put 10 years in and you were one of the first guys to go over there and really start exploring, you know, from the U.S. and doing it on your own, like you say, learning the different places, spending your time over there, guiding um yeah, it was crazy to see your knowledge of that place, um, just putting in your time. But yeah, it's a, it's exploring and seeing those new places. Um, it it's uh it's what excites me and what gets me up in the morning. And and it is a mix and match, like you're saying, of hunting old spots and hunting new. You know, using that knowledge of hunting places year after year, like hunting here in my in my home valley, the Madison Valley. I spent 20 years exploring around and hunting this place. And like you say. You know every drainage and kind of how the elk move through and where to cut them off and where you'll find them, you know, in, in different seasons and different conditions. Um, but, yeah, I just still like to go explore these new places. And in the lower 48, like the west, they, like there's so many cool places to see. You can explore your whole life and still not see it all. It's such great opportunities, and they are some of the finest animals to hunt, the, the mule deer and, and elk and antelope, bear. Like it just doesn't get any better than those species. So um, it's really fun. Yeah, I like to mix and match, hunting hunting the new, hunt with the old. Yeah, and that's what sometimes, you know, in order to – well, growing up in Nevada, it's nearly impossible to get tags at it seemed like that's originally probably why I switched to archery hunting just so I could get tags. And then you start looking at other places you could go if you didn't draw a tag. And that's really what kind of started my whole excitement for just going other places and checking out new stuff is just the desire to just actually be out there and hunting. Cause you're, you're going to have, I mean, there's, there's a lot of guys that I know that just go, Oh yeah. Waiting for their good tags or waiting for whatever tags. But Man, you're just better off to have more. I'd rather have ten elk hunt experiences than one elk hunt experience every ten years because it's like a primo tag, and that's just my philosophy. Because in those ten years, you're probably going to get something pretty good, and you're going to get a lot of experience. And then if you happen to draw a great tag along the way, awesome! You can make the most out of it because you've got the knowledge of, you know, hunting knowledge as well as just knowing about that species or whatever. There's so many guys that I just encourage, like, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm waiting for this, or I want to, you know, I'm waiting for this draw. It's like, man, just go find a good good spot. Don't be afraid to explore, and don't be afraid to come home empty a couple times, but in the long run, it's really, you're just banking experience, you're banking experiences, and it's just, I don't know, I think it's a better system. I do too. That's and you still put in for some good tags here and there with your you know your yeah. tag application strategy. You're still putting in for good places and hopefully you do draw one of those good tags. But in the meantime, yeah, you're hunting over the counter zero one point units and it's amazing once you gain the knowledge like how many like there is trophy critters throughout the West. Everybody wants a 200 inch mule deer. Like there's 200 inch mule deer out there in a bunch of easy to draw units. Like they build big bucks and big bulls in these units. You just got to get out, explore and figure it out. And you're right. You can wait 10 years for one good tag. Or you can be hunting for 10 years, and inside that 10 years, you're probably going to bump into a pretty good bull along the way or a pretty good buck along the way that you're going to harvest and get all that experience and experiences, just like you said. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Uh, what tags do you draw this year? Um, I didn't really draw a lot of tags this year, but I've got a lot of trips planned, so that's always good. Like, it's actually probably a good year not to draw a lot of tags, but 
I did draw um, a, a mule deer tag just pretty close to home here in Nevada. Um, one that I – it was funny. I, I didn't even really put in I, – I normally don't put in for it, and I've planned so much on which areas in Nevada I'm going to put in for. And I thought, ah, I'll just throw this one as my second choice or whatever and ended up drawing it. So it's cool. It's fairly close to um, home, so I can kind of do a lot of scouting and, and hunt it. And there's some good deer in there. Um, and some, just some areas that I haven't got, I haven't hunted it since I was, I think I took, I did my first archery hunt in there when I was 12 or 13. So to go back to that area is pretty sweet. Yeah. I think I was 13. So it, to go back to that area will be pretty cool with a little, a lot more experience and just see, um, it'll be kind of fun to just hunt that area again. Cause I haven't hunted it in so long. Um, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to that. And then, um, and then I drew a uh, mountain goat tag in Kodiak. Uh, my brother and I put it in as a party. And um, my friend Jeremy, um, who's an outfitter there, we're going with him. So that'll be really fun. Uh, I love hunting with my brother, Jason. So we don't get to hunt too much anymore. So when we draw something crazy in Alaska, that's kind of always our, our trip if we can uh, swing it. So that's going to be a pretty sweet, uh, pretty sweet trip there. Really looking forward to that. I've wanted to hunt goats for a long time and, I've put in everywhere and that's the first goat tag I've drawn. So, um, I'm really excited about that. Dude, congratulations. What time of year are you going to go? So that's going to be, um, October. Yeah. It can be yep. absolutely gnarly in Alaska in October, huh? Yeah. You know, the, the, the cool thing about that hunt is there's a lot of goats and it's off of, I, so it's the South or one of the road system, uh, tags there. So, um, you know, it's cool because you get that whole backcountry experience, but you don't have to fly in. You can just, you literally just park at the trailhead and start hiking. And that's pretty sweet. Like, um, as far as just accessibility, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, and, and I think, I don't know if we're, I don't know if we're going to film it or do anything with it. But like, this is a perfect, uh, hunt if we are going to film, because how many times you get to go on like two archery goat hunts at once and, and not have to fly all your stuff in and save the cost on flying and all that stuff. So, um, but we might just, we'll probably just film each other just for fun and, um, I'll, I don't know, share it on social media or something maybe, but I'm just looking forward to just having a good trip and really excited about just kind of having that experience of a goat hunt. Yeah, how cool. Well, and you've just gotten used to filming your hunts. You do, um, you film them solo. You take all your own pictures, all your own video. Um, but you've gotten really good at, at video and hunts that you're not even going to make into a show. You share a lot of your hunts through social media. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm like, if I, if I've got it, that's easy for me to share it that way. Um, you know, without spending a lot of time editing or whatever, but still being able to share it. And I think people like to watch it. Um, if they don't, then I'll probably just, I don't know. I don't know if I then put more energy into doing fewer hunts, but just, um, you know, making them for solo or something like that. But I, I, I enjoy doing it that way because it's like, cool. You get to share it it's nearly, it's pretty close to real time. It, you know, it just depends on where you're at a lot of time placing on a service. So I just, you know, save each day as it happens and then load it when I get home or, or when I get back into service or whatever. But, um, yeah, I, I actually enjoy that. It's fun to be creative and I, I like the challenge of trying to capture my stuff on video. I've always loved filming my hunts like ever since I was a kid. So every time I've gone into the, the field, it's been with some form of video camera just for, for fun sake and just to be able to look back on it. I mean, I would film stuff and that would, was always my, like, christmas gift to my dad when i was a kid is just i would edit a video and be like oh here here's our hunts from the whole season or whatever just always have that camera and that gun or bow or whatever handy um and it's so cool just being able to look back on all that and have all those memories and have them all you know if i ever want to go relive a hunt it's like sweet i can just go look through my computer and like check out some video or whatever it's, it's just fun i enjoy it Man, well, um, it's such a great platform nowadays, and um, that Instagram story, it's such an easy way to share those hunts, and, and you're the best at it. God, your stories are so good and so engaging, you know, um, and it's so fun like that. 
that media style, like you say, to be in that real time, even if you recorded it and put it out four days later when you get back to service or whatever, but you're following around in real time while, while you're on that hunt. And those short 15 second clips is, is such a great format to share it where you can mix in, um, you can mix in photos, you can mix in video, you can mix in text. Um, you can really tell the entire story through those 15 second clips. And so I know I absolutely love them and just following yours has made me do more of them and more of the stories and they really don't take away from the hunt. Like, um, sometimes video in these hunts is a production. It makes it, you know, so much more difficult to be successful. It makes it more difficult no matter how your video and your hunts, but, um, with an extra cameraman, an extra guy, you're paying daily wages and then having to edit the whole thing to get it's such a major production and process where the Instagram stories you just have your phone and your camera and you just capture clips and you really are engaged in the hunt and then you get back four or five days later and you put together those days the clips the photos so it really tells the entire story man it's such a fun format to put together yeah thanks yeah it's fun and you're right. Like I hate anything that makes me feel like I'm not there just hunting. And for me, you know, when I'm filming myself, it it feels like I'm still immersed in the process. Um, so it, it, it's not like detracting from it in any way. I just hate anything that feels like I, you aren't really, you're taking away from your experience, you're taking away from your hunt. But when I'm like looking through it at things through a camera or whatever, I, I tend to remember it better because you, you have to pay a little more attention. I might be setting settings on the camera and like thinking about the lighting and thinking about the angle of things. And it, it just actually, for me, actually puts me even more in the moment than take it away. Cause some people always ask, Oh, does it take away from the experience? But for me, when I'm messing with the cameras and, and doing that stuff, it actually makes me pay more attention to everything around me. And I, I remember the whole trip more because there's times when I, ju I just go out and don't mess with the cameras or anything like that. And you kind of, you kind of lose all those nuances of the things around you, you know, because you aren't paying as much attention to maybe a plant that you think is cool. And you spent two minutes taking a photo or video of this one plant and like, I'll remember that, you know, it, it, it actually took time to pay attention to that or like the, the sunrise, and the sunsets and those kind of things because you're like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to capture that. And, and you really, you invest time into those little things along the way. And you actually, I actually end up remembering things better and clearer and just have, I don't know, just a more in-depth experience when I do those things with the camera. So for me, it actually adds to the experience, doesn't take away from it, which you know, might seem counterintuitive, but that's, I think if you tried it, you'd be like, oh yeah, you, you'd, you'd understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, that hits home. I've never thought about it that way, Remy, like, um, but you're absolutely right. It adds to the experience capturing it in the human memory is so foggy. Like, um, you kind of remember your own reality or you mem remember pieces and parts, but you try to remember back to an exact experience you have you can't paint the picture all around you like you can with a video or like you can with a photo. And that just seems to jog your memory so much of the place you were standing and the place you were at. I think you're right. I think it adds to the experience and it almost when you're telling the story through like an IG story, you're, you're right. It doesn't take away from it. It's almost like, um, it's almost like you got another buddy with you or you're you're trying to tell the story to somebody else or you're you're trying to put it in context uh, so somebody else can understand where you're at and have that experience with you. And I, I just think it's so neat that you can share that in real time now to where it's not a, a year later and a bunch of editing and a bunch of production. And I like putting together videos, but I definitely don't like to do every hunt that way. So much of this hunting um, – you know, it sounds hippy dippy, but it is the experience. It's the reason we love it. Is is we're out there, immerse ourselves in the challenge and in nature. You know, the the decisions we make directly affect our safety, and, and it's just it's wild and free. the The world isn't nerfed out there. You get to you you are in charge of your next move, and I I just absolutely love that feeling. And yeah, the IG stories just don't take away from it. And I like what you said. I think they do add to it. Yeah. Yeah, it might seem weird at first, but I think if you, you know, like a lot of people, are like, oh, I want to get into filming and then, or whatever. If you, even if you're just on a hunt, it's fun to like, if I'm on a hunt, film my friends or take photos while I'm out there, capture it. But it does take a little bit of time too. That's the other thing. That's why for me, it's just easier to do it myself because I know 
if I'm going on a stock or whatever, I want to be able to take the adequate amount of time that I need to do whatever I want to do. And it's way easier for me to do by myself than with someone. But on that, um, on that Saco hunt for the water Buffalo, I actually had somebody with me all like doing a lot of the filming. And then we kind of just, you know, I would do my thing. He would do his thing. And we kind of combined stuff and put it together at the end. And that actually worked pretty good. That was the first time I've tried doing something like that. Um, you know, it took a little bit of pressure off, but then on the flip side too, you're like, well, I don't know. I just, I get so used to filming myself or doing my own thing that it's, e I don't know. It's just easy to not have to wait for someone else or whatever, you know, it's just easy to do it yourself sometimes. So it's a cool, um, this is a cool format for that one. It's just a little bit different. You just get a little bit higher quality than someone else is there because you don't have to keep going back and doing, picking up your tripod and carrying it, moving it and setting it down. It saves a lot of time when someone else is there. Yeah, well, they're just focused on the footage where you're focused on the footage and the hunt. So I, I'm with you. It does, it does put some good stuff together. But you're right. You just get in the routine, and I actually take pride in in capturing my own photographs. A lot of times I'll have a photographer with me and I just want to take my own photos as well. Just, uh, I take pride when I get a good photo. I, um, so, so I like having my own photos, my own video, my own stuff that I've taken. And I, I see you too. You take a lot of pride in, in the photos and the stories you put together. And, and a lot of that is, is like being able to have control over it. And, you got to have an eye for it. Like a lot of it, like you've got a really good eye. You've been doing it a long time in video and hunts and doing these stories. But I, I noticed even as like in New Zealand when we had marched together, you got a really good eye for a good shot. You know, like uh, filling up your water bottle at the creek is going to add to that story, add to the deal. And so you grab that really quick. And so you've got a good eye for grabbing shots to where you're not wasting a lot of energy taking thousands of photographs to use one or two. Like every time you stop to grab content, that's something you're going to use. So you have a good eye for that where you're not wasting a lot of time. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that, I think that just came from like doing solo hunters so much. And when you go, oh, I'm going to do a, a six day backpack trip and I've got two batteries and one memory card. You oh, know? No. <laughs> and you're like, we're going to make that's just how I would always roll. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I'm, uh, show's going to we're going to edit it into a 23 minute show. I'm going to get 27 minutes of footage. <laughs> like no joke i did not spare much time for leftover just garbage so it's like if, it, if i take it it's getting used and so you just gotta make it good you know <laughs> yeah that's absolutely right um well yeah uh so you got those those early season that early season deer hunt in nevada um didn't you aren't you um you you just got back from europe which hunt was that um, I, that was, uh, I just went and hunted, uh, roe deer and hunt jack in England. It was actually like a quick stopover, um, uh, more of like a field trip than anything. I thought, ah, it'd be kind of interesting to see how they do things over here. Um, while I was over there, well, I was actually in Lithuania for a wedding. So, um, I wish I would have done a little bit more research and, um, because there is like right now the roe deer are running in a lot of places, but having been over there a couple of times this year, uh, different places in Europe, I've realized there's a, so much hunting over there that's actually pretty accessible. So that's kind of going to be my next little foyer into the just different stuff, just exploring different places over there and places you can go hunt on your own. And um, there's just so much opportunity that all, I don't even think a lot of people realize, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. And, uh, and a lot of hunting culture too, that I just think, over here, we don't even don't even think about lots of cool species and um, like you know in most of those Nordic countries, I mean, they hunt brown bears regularly. And you're like, what? You can hunt brown bears in Europe? Yeah, I mean, there's there's bears, moose, um, reindeer, caribou in some areas, roe deer. Uh, what else? Um, oh, in Finland, there's white-tailed deer. There's just like uh, the, the white tails were actually released there, but. Um, you know, and then you go to other places and there's species of Ibex and there's just so many different species and different things, chamois, just crazy things that you, you don't even really think about. And you look at it, oh, red deer, red stag, um, fallow deer. Yeah, there's just so much different stuff and so much opportunity in different countries. And quite a few of them are like have a pretty strong hunting culture that almost it's it's a different hunting culture, but it's pretty cool, like 
how in some of the Nordic countries and Baltic countries, I mean, hunting's ingrained in everyday life. Like you go to a restaurant and the, the food that gets served is seasonal and it's something that the chef himself shot, like a moose or whatever. And that's pretty cool. Like you just don't get that experience here. Man, that is really cool. Yeah, it's um, so different. It's like uh, it lets, you're a true explorer by nature. You're always looking for the next frontier and those different species and those different habitats. Uh, and, and it's so cool that you're finding opportunities um, to go over there and be able to experience that. Um, man, you name some really cool species over there. and It's just like every place you go is just so different too, but there's got to be – like a, the a big part of those trips for you has to be like the logistics and the challenge because different countries it's different to put it all together and to get the permits you need and to get your rifle over there there's a lot of logistics and uh, logistic work that has to go into it to make that thing um to to make it all flow and make it go uh smoothly and to be able to get over there and go hunt man that's got to be part of the adventure for you Oh yeah, it's you spend just as much time planning as you do, maybe even more time planning than the actual hunt, at least the first time, because everything's new and you're like, it's kind of like, okay, well, how am I going to do this? Where do I get the permits for that? And it, it's a it's a big process and it takes a. T I mean, sometimes like some of this stuff that I'm thinking about doing, it might be a couple of years before I even actually get on the ground there of just research, talking to people, figuring things out, understanding the logistics. And then, okay, if I do go hunting, how do I get stuff back? What are the rules on that? How do I, what do I do with, how do I take care of the meat while I'm there? Where do I go after I get all just the, the little tiny things that you might not even think about. And then just planning and the things that you need to bring in the, yeah, it, it's a huge process, but some of that's fun for me. It's like before I go to bed at night, instead of whatever, reading a book or whatever, I'm just it's researching things, you know, trying to find people that I could talk to that have maybe been there. and Just all kinds of – just like you do – It was. it's essentially the same process that I do when I drew – if I draw a tag out of state in an area I've never been. The same planning and prepping and understanding the area and talking to biologists or whatever and – and just translating that into a, a different scale of going somewhere else and maybe figuring out something somewhere else. Because my big thing is I love finding places where you can essentially do what I would consider over-the-counter hunts on your own at pretty much any time or maybe it's a certain season or whatever. But New Zealand is a prime example of just finding somewhere where I could go and hunt over-the-counter essentially, no tags or seasons or whatever and legally hunt and just be hunting and i think that that's cool is like my whole thing is just trying to find and explore places where i can go do that and there i've i've done a lot of them around myself out here in the west and there's still so many that i could do but um, it's cool to just kind of think oh man i could go to this other country and do that as well that's like that's a crazy adventure an absolutely crazy adventure yeah um how cool. Uh, are you still putting together – I know we had talked earlier about like a, a Russia snow sheep. Are you still putting that together? Um, yeah, so it's actually um, – I am going to Asia uh, in October, but it's not Russia, and we aren't revealing where it's at just yet. Gotcha. But, um, okay. I'm putting that together, and it will be a pretty sweet – I'm really excited about that. It's been something that I've been thinking about and dreaming about for a very, very long time. Um, so I am planning on hunting sheep and ibex in Asia. Um, and that'll be for, um, on the, for the Sako thing as well. So we'll have somebody filming as well as myself documenting and then doing the stories, like releasing the stories and the videos as quickly as we can. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about that trip. That's kind of my... You know, I, I never like to call anything a once in a lifetime trip, but it's like a it's a trip that you think about your whole life. <laughs> so that's like a better way to phrase it. You know, man, um, how I'm really cool. Excited. 
But, yeah, I remember yeah. you talking about that, huh? And I know you've been planning it for a couple years, if not longer, to go over and do it and putting the logistics together. How neat it's going to come together to hunt ibex and hunt snow sheep uh, somewhere there in Asia. Um, yeah, that's going to be an unreal trip. And how cool that you've got somebody else to help gather content. So I know you're putting out the um, IG stories. Like, um, is there going to be another home for these videos once you get done with them, like the buffalo or like the sheep hunt? Yeah, I just started putting them on my um, on my YouTube page as well, my personal YouTube page, which honestly I haven't used in probably twelve years. So I'm tr I'm trying to kind of revamp that, at least just have a place where things last a little bit longer. Because I know in some of the other social media stuff like Instagram or Facebook, everything is just so so daily. It's like if you miss it and you want to see it again, it's hard to find, and it's not really conducive to um, sharing with people or whatever if you wanted to. So I do have, I'm starting to put more videos up on my uh, YouTube page. And I think I was kind of thinking about it. I was like, man, I got um, just so much content that I don't use even. I'm thinking, man, it just, for a long time, my whole thing was like, I wanted something to be qual like really good quality. And I just was afraid to put stuff on YouTube for a long time. I just didn't want to, I don't know why. And I just got so busy with other stuff. I just didn't have time to edit things or put things on there. Um, we did, we always put the solo stuff on the solo YouTube page, but my own personal one, I stopped really using. So I think I'm just going to start putting that kind of stuff on there. And then even just doing more like tip stuff on there and just random, not random stuff, but like quality stuff, quality information that's easy to put on there. Um, so I'm going to do some more of that. So I'm just kind of just really just revamping my, youtube stuff and probably just going to start being more active on there um at least so i've got like a library of things if i ever need to go back to or whatever there they are somewhere oh good on you yeah that uh that's such a great home for your for your content like you say you've got to have hundreds of thousands of hours of, of content and, and and people are hungry for that content and you're right the the platform, the Facebook and the IG is so daily and they're good stories, but it's tough to it, it's tough to find stuff in the past to where that YouTube. Yeah, if you had those videos out, um, guys would get a lot out of it. I, I think that's a great move for you. You need a home like that for all your videos. Yeah, it's like uh, it'll be I'm, I'm excited about it. You know, whether people are able to find it or not, I don't know, you know especially because I haven't used it in so long. Like it's probably on the back list, but it, it is there. So if people want to find stuff, I've got like some real old stuff on there. It's just probably slightly embarrassing to even have. And then, uh, <laughs> should just block it and turn it all off. Um, but uh, no, it's, it's actually funny to just see some of the, um, I actually looked through some of my old videos and like, man, it was just, you know, in, at the time I was like, that was cool. But now I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'll probably, I'm going to put stuff on there that I'll, I'll be thinking that too. You know, like, what was I thinking? Why did I do that? Um, but no, honestly, it'll be cool to have a place where you know I can share some of that stuff and where people can find it hopefully easily. And oh. yeah, I'm excited about it. So yeah, no, that's perfect. And if you build it, they'll come. Uh, uh, people want that content, and your content is so good that yeah, you start putting stuff on there, it's going to grow pretty quick. Um, but yeah, uh, like um, those those little little video snippets and information. Like, there's a new age of hunters that are really trying to cut that learning curve, and so to have a place where you can go find that and go find those videos, and, and then join in on the hunt. You've been doing it for so long. You're like um, you look at the stuff from the past, and you almost get embarrassed by it because uh, you've come so far. But but video, it's an art form where it's just like hunting, like the. The more experience that you have, the better you get at it. The more videos you put together, the the better you get at knowing which shots you need to put it together. And I always thought, like, um, I'm doing the coolest adventures and coolest hunts around. If I could just have a cameraman and just capture it, I would put out the best videos out there. And I was wrong at first. Like, I just – I should, I didn't have the experience to know what kind of shots I need to be able to tell the story. And so – you know, it's taken a handful of years of really going on these hunts, thinking about it, reviewing footage, editing footage, 
and, and I'm just getting to the place now where I'm actually proud of, of the videos that I'm putting out, and I think they reflect the experience that I had in there. But that's that's an art form. That is really tough to do, to, to be able to transcribe that experience or be able to show that experience that you're having on that hunt and to put it to film and then show it within the constraints of you know whatever it is, a 22-minute video or a, a 27 or, or even a 10-minute or even a 5-minute video to have that – show your hunt and show that experience is really tough to do. It takes time and experience. Yeah. That's the thing is like, you know, starting out, you go on these, you like, that is the most epic adventure I've ever been on in my life. And you look at the, what you've got, and you're like, that does not translate at all. <laughs> and, this, and, and that's probably, I think part of the reason that I really, when I was, you know, by filming myself, I was able to just really, like, okay, it's on me to show the experience how it is, because that's the hardest part is actually showing it how it is. And there's some videos that I've done, like say that other people have filmed. Um, one that I can think of was like a moose hunt that I was on with my brother in Alaska. We weren't, I wasn't filming it. Someone else was filming it. But like when I watch that, I think like a lot of people think, oh, that was a cool video. And I just don't really like it personally, only because I know everything that happened that wasn't in that. <laughs> and it just makes me go, Man, it was just such a different experience for me than what that video shows. I mean, the the highlight reel is there, but the actual grinding and and how tough we had it and the things that went wrong, but none of that's there. And you just it's it, those are the things that just remain in hunting stories. But you look at it, you go, man, that's the the best the one the videos that I like the best and the ones that I am the most proud of are the ones that really just capture how that experience, how everything went down. And, you know, and, and, and so over the years, like, I really feel like that's why I like the solo hunter stuff because when those, those videos come out, it just feels like that, that's what happened, you know? And the way that I do those, I film things as they happen and it just feels more natural. I mean, that's why I'm like, okay, I'm really proud of some of that stuff because it was hard to get, but also it really just captured that hunt the best that I could. And I think that there's always things that you can't get, but over time I've learned how to kind of capture the things that really show what's going on. Yeah, that's it. Um, you know, uh, capturing the kill shot is one thing, but that doesn't make the video. It's telling the story so so people can be there with you, and it's capturing the the highs and the lows. It's When you don't want to turn the video camera on or you don't want to tell the camera something, that's it's the exact time to hit the record button, you know, because that's authentic to catch you in the low – after you miss a shot or after you blow a stock or to, to catch your emotion or like fear in your eyes when you've got big storms rolling in or, you know, whatever the case is. But it seems like uh, uh, you have to do a good job at not only capture, capturing the highs, but capturing the lows and real emotion and authenticity. Yeah. And that's, that's the hard, the hardest part for me is getting the motivation. I think for anybody that films or does anything, the hardest part is to get the motivation to take the camera out and the weather shit, because you're probably like, I buy all my cameras. They aren't cheap. Like I do not want to destroy them because of one stupid shot in the rain, <laughs> you know? So you really have to like, you can only so show so much, but you also kind of want to get that as well. I'm always torn. I'm like, uh, eh. so I've got a GoPro that I just like, all right, rain shit shot. And it never looks bad. You know, like you remember it on how bad it is and you go, Oh, it, does, it looks like a nice day in this GoPro. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's tough to capture that gnarly weather, uh, through the lens. Like you say, that's a, it's, it is a good idea though, to have that GoPro with the waterproof case. Cause I struggle with that too. Bad weather comes in. It's the best time to take shots, but I, I can't, I can't soak my camera and ruin my camera like it's uh I've got to protect it too, you know, so it's tough to get those pictures and videos when the weather is bad. Uh the GoPro is a good idea though. It'd be a good idea too um like I know capturing uh time lapses at night and like big lightning storms that roll in and stuff. It's pretty cool for that. You can really capture some good shots with that GoPro. It, it's just like anything, just get in the habit of using it. And you use yours a bunch on your stock. And even if you didn't get the, the kill shot on your big camera, you usually get it on your GoPro so you can edit everything together. Cause you know, most of the time you're filming by yourself trying to get the kill shot with a bow and arrow, which is extremely difficult. Yeah, that's what, I mean, 
I've gotten to the point now where I figured out the ways to make it easier on myself. And it's just so many little things that have gone wrong in the past and blown it for me and just made me so frustrated. But now it's gotten to the point where it's almost, it's become a lot easier. And I think it's just, just repetition of doing it and knowing the little nuances of how to set up the tripod while I'm stalking and how to move things and the type of gear that helps me, you know, like the type of camera head or tripod head and just like different stuff over the years that made me faster and better at it. Um, but yeah, man, I, there, I've gone through lots of struggle, lots of struggle, just grind, like knowing that I, and, and the hardest part is I, I learned early on that if I didn't commit to the filming, then you just never get anything. It's like anytime you can take, if you go, Oh, it doesn't matter if I get the shot on there. I'll just take the shot and you'll never, you like never get the shot. You'll never do it. So you, you almost have to say it's all or nothing. And that's, that's the hardest part sometimes. I mean, I can think back of like uh, one time, probably what would have been the best meal deer of my life. I missed out on because I committed to the cameras and I wasn't going to shoot unless I could get it on film. And afterwards I'm like, why did I do that? But I was also like, that was probably the most proud I've been of myself saying, okay, because if I didn't do that, I would never get like I just constantly do that <laughs> because it's it's like a it's like a drug like the easy way you know, I'll just I'll just not do it this time I'll do it next time and you'll never do it so you just kind of once I learned that you just have to commit then I I, I became better at it because it forced me to just really do everything I could to to get the shot or whatever for that and it made it um, it was difficult but it, it made me better at it for sure. That directly applies to my experiences. I I started off videoing myself, and like you say, you have to commit to it. It has to be a commitment to film and capturing the hunt above and beyond harvesting that animal on that tag. And so, yeah, when you go on those, you, you just commit to the video and commit to getting it. And so every time you're on the stock, you put it up there. But you're right, is that, that drug of the easy way or that drug of getting that harvest – it's so easy, and I get caught in it nowadays where I like to capture hunts and I like to capture stories. I do a couple hunts where I'm really committed to film, and then I do some hunts where I'm just committed to having that experience and not capturing anything or not capturing the video. And I do like that too, but you're right as the brain takes that easy way. And so whenever you're out and you think you might capture it, I might get the kill shot if it works out, you end up never capturing the kill shot. The only way to get the kill shot and to make the entire film is to commit yourself wholeheartedly to video and capturing it and you almost you have to video these hunts when you go into these you video them like you're going to be successful you just believe that it's going to come together and so you're getting all the shots along the way so there's no make believe at the end there's no shooting a bunch of b-roll like the best hunting videos out there are authentic and in real time and capturing what really happened and i think that you learn that early on and so it was more important of you to to capture real time the real stock than to set up your camera and try to pretend or try to act on the stock to get yourself some B-roll to make the video. And I think that's what you've always been good at. But I need to be better th at that as well is that if I'm going to video or capture those stories, I just need to commit to, to video and wholeheartedly or I'll never capture it. Yeah, yeah, that's – that's the thing. And once you decide to do that, it actually becomes easier because you like, you just accept what it is. You don't, you don't, you aren't constantly ping ponging back and forth between what you want to do and what you, you're doing. You just, you just do it. And then it just becomes easier and you just get more practice by doing it, by actually like committing to it. You just every day you're getting practice doing it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, you just commit to it and then like then you're not you're not in that struggle of wondering what you're going to get and what you're not. You just like you say, it's second nature. And I can see hunting with you, it's just second nature. Like um your video and everything and taking pictures along the way, no matter if you're going to use it for your story or not, you're just you're just capturing your hunt every time you're out. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Like the other day, I just I'm sitting on the plane, bored. I'm just like I was just scrolling through my photo reel, like roll, looking at all those uh, photos and stuff, video from our uh, our tar hunt. You know, I rewatched the, your shot on that on the first nanny that you shot, and I was like, yeah, this is cool. it was fun. It's like reliving the hunt when I'm stuck 
on an airplane or doing something I don't want to do. I can just kind of escape and go through that and just remember those little places and remember those hikes and remember, Oh yeah. I remember getting water in this Canyon and yeah, just different stuff. It's fun to fun to relive even just for personal use. Oh, it's so fun to relive. There's never a dull minute in today's day and age, you know, or a dull moment like you uh, having those phones like they're good and bad. And you definitely have to have discipline and not be on the screens all the time. But for being on an airplane or waiting at an airport and then to be able to transpose yourself to that hunt in New Zealand or whatever the case is and to, to relive it. Like the human memory just isn't that crisp, like isn't that. But to look back at a video and to be in that place on that stock with that shot, it really puts you back there. It jogs the memory where it's uh, uh it seems like the 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 memory is 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 real or right there in front of you, and it just sparks things in your brain where then you see pictures and you you remember being right in that spot. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, so cool. Well, um, man, thanks a million for taking the time and being on. Um, I I know you're busy traveling around here and there and and looking towards season to the west. I'm gonna have fun following along on your um IG stories this year to see how you do. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah I'm really looking forward to this season. It's gonna be good good year. I got a lot of cool stuff coming up, and yeah, man, some of the some of the most exciting hunts though are some that are just the ones that. I don't know. I love antelope hunting. I'm doing a little road trip for, I just checked today. So I got my 900 antelope tag in Montana and I got a Idaho antelope tag archery. So I'm looking forward to that hunt just as much as some of the other hunts, you know, it doesn't have to be a crazy hunt. Just there's some hunts that it's just, just to be out there and have a good time. And, you know, hopefully I'll, I, I never, I never really film those archery antelope hunts just because it's, I just go out to have a good time or whatever, but I think I might share some of that this year. That'd be fun to do. I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to that too. So a lot of cool stuff coming up. I'm excited about it. Well, we have so many great opportunities right around us too. And to take advantage of those, that antelope hunting with the bow and arrow is my funnest hunt every single year. I absolutely love it. I love the stocks, the close encounters, how switched on those animals are. And you gain years of experience in days just because you get so many chances and so many stocks. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. I got to get on and make sure I got my 900 tag. I think I'm eight or nine years in a row for that uh, Montana archery tag. So hopefully I got it again and uh, we'll be archery hunting. But yeah, there's some great antelope around and um, it's great to hunt those prairies. And um, yeah, it's just so fun. The The fall season is fun where you get to do a lot of those experiences out west. So yeah, man, I'm pumped. It's going to be fun. Well, thanks a bunch for taking the time. I really appreciate it, Remy. And uh, I'll check in with you soon. Sounds good. Talk to you later. Okay. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Uh, really fun conversation with Remy. Uh, again, just feel like he's a, a modern day adventure. Just I get so much inspiration from you know these these hunts that he's going on and the logistics that he has to put together. And and also Remy's just got a ton of skill. Um, you know he's a, a really good bow hunter, really good rifle hunter. He's got great instincts and really knowledgeable. And and experience is really the best teacher. And he gets a ton of experience in hunting. You know different species and different habitats. So uh, really cool to get him on the podcast. We'll get him on again. Uh, Remy has his own podcast starting up. Make sure to check that out. It's called Cutting the Distance. Um, he, he's going to do a podcast where he talks about his hunts and his experiences and then um, what he's learned from it. So I'm sure it'll be a great podcast. Uh, so make sure to look up that and check that out. Uh, also want to thank our sponsors for today's show, Yeti Coolers. Um, Yeti coolers, yeah, they just changed the way I hunt. Like we say, uh, like I say, uh, used them a bunch in in Hawaii. Um, they work great there. They they work great for all my hot weather hunts. They also work good for my late season hunts. I can just keep ice longer. These late season hunts, when I kill like a a rutting mule deer, um, and it's so cold outside, a lot of times it can be zero or negative ten. If it freezes that meat, you know, you have a tough time butchering. You have to thaw it out, and uh, I can keep it at a cool temperature to age inside a cooler where it won't freeze solid. So uh, it's real advantageous for early season hunts, late season hunts. Uh, Soft-sided coolers are great for flying and traveling and great in the boat too. I've been using them in the boat as well. And uh, then all their thermoses and cups, um, they just make great products and I uh, really appreciate the support. So thanks to Yeti. If you're in the market for some new coolers, make sure to check them out. 
over there at Eastman's just getting ready for our hunts, um, getting ready for this antelope hunt. Super excited about this. I think my buddy Dan will head down. And uh, it's my wife's busiest weekend at work here. So we were going to travel to the eastern side of the state and uh, check out some spots. But uh, I think I'm going to have to stay close to home here, take care of the dog and hang out with my daughter a little bit and uh, support my wife while she's got this busy weekend to work or whatever. So um, we'll do that. But I'll be hunting around for opener opens Thursday and and uh, yeah, just super excited. Boy, it's it's fun now that season's here. You know, it's just you know, we've put all the work in, we've put all the shooting in, you know, now it's just time to go test our skills in the mountains. And I'm super excited for that test. So, um, yeah, this antelope hunt's going to be fun. And then, um, I've got a couple articles that I've turned in. I'm ahead of schedule, which is great. Uh, turned in one for the bow hunting journal, one for the Eastman's hunting journal. So I won't have to be doing that during September and, uh, just really focus on the hunt. So, uh, super excited. Make sure to check out those articles coming out. And uh, tons of good podcasts coming up here, getting some really good guests, working on another one this week. And uh, just get you guys that really good information that's going to help you during season. Uh, also need to sit down and record this solo one, so maybe I can do that tonight. Take some time. And, you know, there's just so much, um, like, during season. Like I say, you've put in so much training, like keeping yourself mentally sharp, keep yourself pushing hard. Uh, Keep your eye on the prize like during season. There's such an attitude it takes and then to continue your shooting to to have confidence in the mountains. And um, there's just so much goes into like during season, the effort you need to put forth. And 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 I I really want to orchestrate and organize my thoughts on it. Uh, I've been I've started a page of notes and then like like really get them concise where it makes sense and um well, you know just what's important to me during season here share some of my goals and for the season and and um so I'm going to put that down I'm going to record that solo one get it out to you guys hopefully I can get it out um this week maybe early next week Uh, Try to sit down and record it, get an intro and an ending on it, and get it out to you guys. But that'll be a great one. So a bunch of good content coming up, and hunting season is here. I cannot wait. (laughs) So antelope season in a couple days. I'm sure you guys got some hunts you're working towards. And, um, yeah, good hunting this season to all you guys that are are putting in the work to to get better and to improve. Um, It's going to pay off for you. And uh, can't wait to share in your success this season. So keep working hard towards your goals. And I'll check in with you next week.